Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. We'll be thinking about two very different things today, waiting and action. Welcome. It's time to hear more from Elizabeth Elliot and about Elizabeth Elliot as we look into the life and message of this woman. She called us to live to a higher standard each day. Not to be satisfied with throwing a little religion into life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. How to simplify your life. Can you relate to the idea of simplifying things? We'll be hearing from Jan Wismer as she talks about the first Gateway to Joy radio program recording session. And Barbara Riach, forgiveness. That's coming up later. Our two Gateway to Joy broadcasts for today, Do It Now, and part four, Give It to Jesus. Do you ever struggle with procrastination when really you know now is the time to do it? Maybe you can relate to what Elizabeth has for us today. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot continuing my talk today about the consolation of obedience. All this week I'm talking about how to simplify your life. And there are so many simple principles that really are profound that we find in the scripture. I didn't make these up. And the last thing that I read yesterday was from Isaiah 58:10. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a watered garden. When we just start deliberately, consciously, faithfully doing what God has told us, we're going to find the consolation of obedience. One day when my brother Tom was just a little boy, he did what he was always allowed to do. He got all the brown paper bags out of the drawer in the kitchen and he spread them out very neatly. My brother Tom to this day has everything in straight lines on his desk and he hardly ever has anything on his desk at all. But when he does, everything's in straight lines and he and I like order. And so as a little boy of maybe three, I don't know, maybe he was four, Uh, He was permitted to do that on one condition, that he put those paper bags back in the drawer when he had finished playing. My mother came into the kitchen. The bags were still on the floor. Tommy was not there. She found him in the living room where my father was playing the piano. She said, Tommy, I want you to come and put away the paper bags. And Tommy looked up with his beautiful navy blue eyes that have such long dark lashes, just looked up with such a seraphic smile at my mother. And he said, but I want to sing Jesus Loves Me. Whereupon my father took occasion to press home the principle that it's no good singing the praises of God if you're being disobedient to your mother. Now, I'm sure my father couched it in language that Tommy understood. But peace followed the tearful refusal. The child who refuses to do what he's supposed to do. He didn't want to put those paper bags away. He wanted to sing, Jesus Loves Me. But in order to get the consolation of obedience, he had to obey. I had a letter just recently from a mother telling me about a child who refused to say thank you to his uncle for the stuffed toy. The child was sent to his room. He was four years old. He was a stubborn Swede. So he was visited again by one of his parents, asking him if he was ready to come down and say thank you to his uncle for the toy. And he said no. Four times they called him to come down. The aunt and uncle went out to dinner. There was a long period, of course, for the child to ponder his refusals. So when they came home, the child said, Thank you, Uncle Tom. I'm sorry. That child is now 14, a joy to his parents. His parents are very firm. 
He had to work hard and do chores. He now does his own laundry, irons, has a black belt, owns a checking account, and is active in the church. It was not easy for those young parents to break that strong will. And I would call a strong will like that a stubborn will. But praise the Lord, they were firm. And so that child experienced the consolation of obedience. But at what a price! Aren't we just like that? We can think of all kinds of ways of getting around what God wants us to do. And the truth is that probably it is very simple. It is something staring us straight in the face. And we're saying, I don't want to. I don't want to. Next principle of how to simplify your life. Do it now. Psalm 119, 60 says, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commandments. James 4.14 says, You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now think about that in connection with those three words, do it now. I've been learning that only in my old age. It's so easy to put off some little thing that you think is really a very trivial little thing, but it's something that maybe you walk past six times a day in your house and you do nothing about it. Well, I have put this little card in the corner of my mirror so that I see do it now every time I walk past that dresser in our bedroom. It is quite impossible, said somebody named Martineau, that an idle floating spirit can ever look up with clear eye to God, spreading its miserable anarchy before the symmetry of the creative mind. In the midst of a disorderly being that has neither center nor circumference, the heavens, with their everlasting faithfulness, look down on no sadder contradiction than the sluggard and the slattern in their prayers. It is quite impossible that an idle floating spirit can ever look up with clear eye to God. Second Chronicles 24, 5. This is when Joash had decided to restore the temple. And he says, go to the towns, collect money to repair the temple, do it now. But the Levites did not act at once. And you know perfectly well that when you don't do it now, what you know you should have done now, it's going to come back to haunt you when you did not act at once. Second Samuel three seventeen and 18 says, For some time you have wanted to make David your king. Now do it. For the Lord promised David by my servant David, I will rescue my people Israel. So there's two passages in Scripture that say essentially the same thing. One says, do it now. The other says, now do it. Will you? It will simplify your life. Next one, great simplifier, do the next thing. From an old English parsonage down by the sea, there came in the twilight a message to me. Its quaint Saxon legend Deeply engraven, hath, as it seems to me, teaching from heaven. And on through the hours the quiet words ring like a low inspiration. Do the next thing. Many a questioning, many a fear, many a doubt, hath its quieting here. Moment by moment, let down from heaven, time, opportunity, guidance are given. Fear not tomorrows, child of the king. Trust them with Jesus. Do the next thing. Do it immediately. Do it with prayer. Do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe neath his wing, leave all resultings. Do the next thing. Looking to Jesus ever serener, working or suffering be thy demeanor. In his dear presence, the rest of his calm, the light of his countenance be thy psalm. 
strong in his faithfulness, praise and sing. Then, as he beckons thee, say it with me now, do the next thing. I had a letter from a lady who told me of how when her father died, the lawyers who were in charge of his inheritance made off with virtually all the money. And here was a mother left with seven children and no means of making a living as far as she could see. And the woman who was just a young girl at the time said she will never forget when they came back from the funeral and walked into that empty house, mother picked up the broom and began to sweep the kitchen floor. Do the next thing. And as we do the one thing that God is telling us to do now, he will open up the way before us, showing us what we're supposed to do next. Make sure you get them in the right order. When I think of all the various mundane household duties that I had to take care of when my second husband, Addison Leach, was ill, I have to say that it was that simple four-word maxim that carried me through many a day and many a long and agonizing night. Just do the next thing. When my husband Jim Elliott, my first husband, was killed in the jungle, what was I supposed to do? People have often asked me, when did you go back to Ecuador? And I have to sort of chuckle because I didn't go back. The Lord had given me a great many things that I needed to do. When Jim died, of course, there was no one else, no other missionary on that station. And so I had lots more things to do than I had ever had before. Well, how could I get through that? I look back and I think I didn't know anything except to do the next thing. My mother had told me that. The headmistress of a boarding school that I went to way back in the 1940s had said that many, many times. And how freeing, how comforting, how calming, and how simplifying that principle is. Just do the next thing. And as I tried faithfully to do the next thing, God showed me what was the thing after that that needed to be done. And I believe he will do that for you. It's my prayer that he will. Later, it's Gateway to Joy 365, Give It to Jesus. How to Simplify Your Life, Part 4. First, though, we hear from Jan Wismer, who had a lot to do with the early days of the Gateway to Joy broadcast. In fact, she's going to talk about the first recording session for Gateway to Joy. She came to Lincoln with 16 12-minute talks prepared. Have you ever had to record 16 12-minute talks? She did that in one day at Back to the Bible. And when she was done with talk number 16, you could not tell if it was talk number one or talk number 16 because she wasn't tired at all. And I thought of something that she always reminded us of. In the calling is the enabling. She went home from Lincoln, she wrote me this letter, and she says, I felt so invigorated. I wasn't even tired, not even on the trip home. I had assumed I might flake out on the plane, but I didn't even take a cat nap. She was born for radio, and God used her in my life and in many of yours. Producer Jan Wismer from the Gateway to Joy broadcast. Later on, we'll hear from Barbara Reock as she talks about forgiveness. First, though, it's Gateway to Joy 365, Give It to Jesus, Part 4 in How to Simplify Your Life. You know, we can try to hold on to the burdens of life. We can try to hold on to the things of this life. Or we can give them to Jesus. I've sort of realized that what I have here is just a whole list of maxims that have been very much a part of my own life. And of course, none of us knows that we're going to be here tomorrow. Uh, one of these days, this tongue of mine is going to be silent. And who knows whether I'm going to do more programs or what. I never have any way of knowing that. And so I just thought, well, I would like to leave with folks 
just some of the things which have helped to simplify my life. And my next one, which is for today, is Give It to Jesus. There's a little poem whose author doesn't seem to be given. It says, Here I hold within my trembling hand this will of mine, a thing which seemeth small. And only thou, O Christ, canst understand how when I yield thee this, I yield mine all. It hath been wet with tears and stained with sighs, clenched in my grasp till beauty it hath none. Now from thy footstool where it prostrate lies, the prayer ascendeth, let thy will be done. So when I say give it to Jesus, the first thing that we must give to Jesus is our will. You can give him everything and name them one by one, whatever it may be right now that he may be speaking to you about that you need to give to him. But I think the best place to start is with the will. Remember that God has given each of us two faculties. One is the will and the other is the emotions. Of course, he's given us other faculties as well, but these are two which seem to be often in contradiction. We women particularly, I guess, are much more prone to go by our emotions. But emotions should be subject to the will because it is the will that chooses. And the emotions are very undependable. They're extremely volatile. We may feel good one minute and feel terrible the next minute. You know how it is. So I would ask, which one governs your life? Is it the emotions or is it the will? And so this poet has put it into poetry by saying, I hold within my trembling hand this will of mine, a thing which seemeth small. Have you given your will to Jesus Christ? I had a letter just today from a woman wanting to know why the Lord is not apparently willing to give her a husband. And I receive letters like this so often. What can I say to these women? I don't know that God is going to give them a husband. And of course, I've heard lots of people say to me, why would God give you three husbands when he's never even given me a date? Your desire for something which God has not given needs to be offered up to him. You need to learn to say, Lord, I don't understand it. I wouldn't have asked for this, but I will give you my will and I surrender myself. Again, I remind you of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was in an absolute agony. And he said, if it is thy will, Father, let this cup pass from me. And it says that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Being human, it was not easy. It was not a simple thing for him to surrender his will to the Father. But his will took over and said, if it is not possible, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Are you ready to give it to Jesus? Clenched in my grasp till beauty it hath none. Now from thy footstool where it prostrate lies, the prayer ascendeth. Let thy will be done. I was talking with a woman in Europe one day, and she was telling me of a terribly wrong attitude that she had. She said, I'm very happily married to my husband. She said, I have absolutely no reason to think that he's ever been interested in any other woman. But she said, you know, Elizabeth, I cannot stand to see him talking with other women. If we're at a party someplace or if we're in church and I see him across the room talking with other women, she said, I am filled with jealousy. What can I do? Well, what could I tell her? I said, give it to Jesus. She said, what do you mean? Well, I said, this is a feeling 
you have told me that you do not think that he is in any way interested in these other women. It's an irrational feeling, but nevertheless, it's absolutely ruining your life. It's ruining your feelings about your husband. Just give it to Jesus. Well, I don't know if I can do that, she said. I don't know how to do that. So I gave her a simple suggestion, something which has been very helpful to me. I said, because I am not a person who floats around up in the atmosphere, the clouds, the ethereal uh, heavens, but I am very, very much of the earth, earthy. And I suppose you radio listeners have had plenty of reason to realize that that is the truth about me. I am very down to earth, and I need all the help I can get. And so I wanted to share with this woman the help that the Lord had given me when I found myself quite upset by my daughter's announcement that she was expecting number five. Now, don't get me wrong. I was delighted that Val was going to have another baby, but I thought it was a little soon. And I felt very upset for her because she was burdened with four children. She was homeschooling. She was the wife of a pastor. She had a great many things on her plate, and I just thought it would have been much nicer if she could have gone another year or two without having another baby. Well, after she and her husband had come into my bedroom at 5 o'clock in the morning to give me this very exciting piece of news, I was not feeling happy about it. And I realized, because I'm sure the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me and reminded me that this was none of my business. A good thing for mothers-in-law and the mothers of married children to remember It is not my business. But I still felt awful about it. And it was then, I believe, that the Lord simply reminded me that what I needed to do was to give my feelings to him. Well, how do you do that? Well, this is what I told my friend in Europe. I said, maybe you could try what I did on that occasion. Just simply get down on your knees, literally put that jealousy into your hands, as it were. Lift your hands up to God and say, Lord, I can't handle this, but you can. Please help me. And you know what happened to me? God completely released me of my feelings that my poor daughter was overburdened and this should not have happened, and I wanted to tell my son-in-law, why don't you sleep in the backyard for a while? The Lord was saying, it's none of your business. Leave it with me. And so I gave it to Jesus. And this woman wrote me a letter from Europe after I got back to the States and said, Elizabeth, it worked. I gave it to Jesus. You can do that too. If there's something that is just making your life miserable, give it to Jesus. Last week, I was talking with a man named Ted Simonson. And he used exactly these same words. He was telling me about several things in his own life. He said, you just give it to Jesus. And he lifted up his hands as he said it. And as I say, I need all the help I can get. So physical gestures help. Get down on your knees, lift up your hands, speak out loud to the Lord and say, Lord, here it is. A Frenchman named Jean-Nicolas Grou in 1731 to 1803, those were his dates, wrote this. It is when the heavenly fire has departed and the soul is cool again that we discover the real quality of our will. It is when the heavenly fire has departed and the soul is cool again that we discover the real quality of our will. Will you give your will to Jesus? I'm sure that there are all sorts of things that my listeners are enduring right now which bother you. Aren't we all like that? We get upset, we get worried, we get bothered about things. We find ourselves losing sleep at night. But you know, God doesn't want us to lose sleep over things. He wants us to trust him. Trust and obey. And so you can give this to Jesus. You can just relinquish the thing which is weighing you down. In 1 Samuel 1.11, we read about Hannah, who had been praying 
desperately that the Lord would someday give her a baby. And she told the Lord that she would give that child to him. And she kept her promise. It was a total offering of the self. God gave her the child, and she gave the child back to God, quite literally, a total offering of herself, a sacrifice, and an oblation. And you know, all of the work that I do, my desk work, my kitchen work, everything else, is something that I can give to Jesus. These are all equally important in God's eyes, I believe. I cook, and I iron shirts, and I wash clothes, and I do things like that. And I think God is just as pleased with those as he is with what some people would call spiritual work. This is your opportunity to give it to Jesus. Gateway to Joy 365, Give It to Jesus, part four in our series, How to Simplify Your Life. Well, before we go, writer Barbara Reock will take about two and a half minutes and talk on the subject of forgiveness. Elizabeth Elliot would say she struggled with forgiveness, just like we do. And from her recordings and books, we know the murder of her beloved husband, Jim, created a deep wound in her own heart. So I welcome the lessons of wisdom from Elizabeth that came as she learned to practice forgiveness. Because we all have people we need to forgive. I'll share with you some of Elizabeth's best advice to us. Because by God's grace, we too can be free from unforgiveness and bitterness. She said, receive God's grace to heal your broken heart. Be straightforward with God, acknowledge the wrong, recognize your emotions, name them and lay them open before the Lord for him to train your response. Lay down your rights, the right to hurt because you've been hurt, the right to demand an apology, and the right to be happy if the other person is proved wrong. And if they ask forgiveness, forgive. If they don't, forgive with God's grace, pray for them. Ask for the help you need to treat them as if nothing had ever come between you and stand with Christ for them. Here I think Elizabeth means if they have not asked for forgiveness from God, then it's all the more important that we pray for them to repent. Well, I think a great place to start if you are struggling with forgiveness comes straight from Elizabeth Elliot. And I quote, To forgive is to die. It is to give up one's right to self, which is precisely what Jesus requires of anyone who wants to be his disciple. Following Christ means walking the road he walked. In order to forgive us, he had to die. Forgiveness is relinquishment. It is a laying down. We can offer it up, writing off whatever loss it may entail in the sure knowledge that the man who loses his life or his reputation or his face or anything else for the sake of Christ will save it. Author Barbara Reock telling us about forgiveness. Well, it looks as though our time together has just about come to an end. But enough time for me to thank you for letting us come into your home, into your office, maybe along with you on your daily walk, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the many resources available for you at elizabethelliott.org. Don't miss it, elizabethelliott.org. Until next time, may God remind you daily you're loved with an everlasting love. And what's underneath? That's right, the everlasting arms.